CLAS, and I am delighted to introduce Dr. Wells. He's an associate professor of anthropology and social informatics. He's also director of the IUSB Center for Excellence in Research and Scholarship, which is called Ceres. He's been here since 2008. In those 10 years, he's <coughs> emerged as a national leader in pivotal conversations on archaeology and the change. Just last week, he was tapped to chair the task force for the Society for American Archaeology on Information Sharing Practices in American Archaeology. So a number of people study and debate and work on the issue of climate change. Josh is doing something about it. Based in part on his MSF and MEH consultancy and grants. Today he will speak on how climate change impacts archaeological sites, historic buildings and cultural landscapes, and what he and his colleagues are doing about it. He will examine the impacts of sea level rise on both known and recorded sites, as well as the potential impacts of population resettlement from sea level encroachment. I'm very excited for you to see a database that provides evidence for this and gives insights about how to mitigate impacts. It's called the Digital Index of North American Archaeology. In short, his record of scholarship is staggering, cutting edge, and influential. He's the kind of scholar we all hope to be not only at the top of his game in research, but also in leveraging that body of knowledge to make a difference. I give you well. She said that on, on the record. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm here to talk, uh, talk today about uh, my, my work with the Digital Index of North American Archaeology, or DINA. Uh, everything I'm going to show you in here today, almost everything, 95% of what I'm going to show you here today, uh, if you Google DINAA, uh, it'll, it'll be the first thing uh, the first thing that pops up. You can go into the DINA interface and recreate uh, any of the, uh, any of these things yourself. Uh, DINA is a public resource as well as a scientific resource. Uh, it's used in education. It's used in outreach. There are. I think eight master's theses and dissertations so far that have uh, incorporated elements of DINA into their into their work. And it, you know, it's only been around uh, for a little over four years now, um, and so it's uh, anybody can use it. And in fact, the fact that it is public and accessible is one of the real strengths of its scientific use because it can be uh, it can be accessed by. Uh, any scientist, any historian, any humanist, uh, any manager of historic places in uh, various governmental structures, in order to uh, work with, in order to work with these information to help them conduct their work, which uh, is what uh, what made it so vital for uh, sea level work that Philip you know, was talking about a minute ago. And Actually, for, uh, for my talk today, I will uh, start out with the sea level work, but I want to talk, uh, I'm going I'm to move beyond that and talk about why the, uh, the public and you know, the public science, the publicly accessible big data approaches that the digital index is using are so vital for uh, understanding, the rec understanding the archaeological record and dealing uh, with climate change, not just on the coasts, but uh, massive infrastructural change inland, dealing with understanding how we're managing heritage resources uh, across the continent, and how we're using those information to educate publics uh, as well as, as well as uh, new generations of science. Uh, so, uh, Dina, the Dina. Is a, is a project that lives with lives on opencontext.org. Opencontext is a, is a web is a web portal. Uh, I'm a member of their editorial board, and it, ser it, it serves as a uh, a place for primary archaeological data publication. It treats data as a kind of first order uh, publication strategy. Put primary data up. And it has, and it allows you to cite it as a direct reference. It allows you to reuse it. Uh, everything on uh, on open context is uh, has some some manner of open Creative Commons license or, or other very liberal reuse license that allows you to um, to reuse the data as long as you're cite, as long as you're citing uh, the original author. Uh, it is a, it, it is a 
pre is not a preferred, but uh, definitely a go-to destination for NSF and NEH projects for people creating uh, uh, data management plans and other uh, data access needs for the project. So Dina is in need of Logitech updates. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, Dina, is, uh, Dina is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and the Federal Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, so, to date, uh, we're, you know, we, haven't, uh, we certainly haven't spent it all, but Dina's uh, had about uh, three quarters of a million dollars that's been, that's been allocated to it by NSF and INLS towards putting together all of uh, towards putting together all of the things you see, you know, see at the moment. Um, it, 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 the NSF uh, side of things funds uh, bringing together new data sets uh, involved, uh, involving new archaeological sites expanding the geographic extent. The IMLS grant uh, helps <coughs> deepen the network into libraries, into museums, into uh, repositories of information that help to expand, that help to uh, enhance the information available about particular archaeological sites. So NSF is helping us uh, grow the grow the extent. IMLS is helping us make it more information rich. Uh, I'll be referring to different those different activities throughout. Probably a, a really important thing that I'll, I'll keep hitting home on uh, is that D, that Dina contains no sensitive information. There is a, a large uh, editorial process, and quality assurance process, that, as well as a number of secure, as well as a number of uh, secure data transfer protocols that go into getting data from uh, governments, from various researchers, uh, in order to stitch them together. But before we put things out on the web publicly, because as I said, you can go Google it and bring it up. Uh, we want to make sure there's nothing in it that, vi that violates, uh, you know, especially federal laws, but also state laws, right, uh, and various ethical sensibilities regarding the locations of sites that can be used to loot, uh, the presence of human, of human remains or other sensitive or other uh, sensitive burial or religious materials related to the Native American Graves Protection and Recreation Act. Uh, you know, and, and that's not just being ethical. Um, you know, they're, they're, if we did it wrong, there's a chance of real prison time as well. Uh, you know, one, of, one of the first uh, rules of tenure is don't go to prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and of course, uh, everything, for those of you who are geographically inclined, uh, everything you see here is also downloadable uh, in, in, in uh, what's known as GeoJSON format, which is directly compatible with a variety of GIS systems um, as well. So, DINA today con uh, contains uh, a little over half a million archaeological sites. It is, uh, and uh, a great many of which uh, in the future <coughs> Uh, that, we, that we have here, but also uh, a wide variety in California. This comes from a relationship with the, uh, especially the Hearst Museum uh, in UC, at UC Berkeley, where they've put uh, all, they've, they're putting all of their uh, indigenous collections into our database, and also accounts for the scattered throughout the West. The, uh, Dina represents uh, the large, uh, the uh, largest completely open source archaeological data. Um, it's linked open data processes mean that every archaeological site that is underneath uh, the cell structure in that, in that heat map you just saw has potential linkages to a wide variety of other, uh, of other data entities on the web. Dina uses a strategy known as linked open data where, uh, where concepts built into archaeological site definitions uh, are, ref, uh, uh, are used, uh, are tied to hyperlinks, which uh, can then be, which can then be tied to various entities that share those certain kinds of information in various places. Uh, a good example is we're working, we are, the, the, uh, the arrows in black are where we have uh, fairly, are where we have fairly complete uh, link, linkages going 
comment on the areas in white are what we're working on currently. So for instance, in JSTOR right now, if you click it, if you uh, find a number of archaeological sites that you're interested in in the digital index, you can use a, you can use a particular filter to sub find which ones of the, uh, which of those sites have been published in an article in, in an article available through JSTOR. And, and then and then it will take you directly to the JSTOR link. And if you have access to the JSTOR, you can download, you can download one of those. It's a great place for primary literature searches. Um, this is incomplete with JSTOR because the history, uh, fun because we just started it. Um, and the major pro and the big process there is recognize it, it is developing text mining mechanisms to recognize archaeological site identifiers within the primary literature. We're, we're working with JSTOR to <coughs> identify what's known as a Smithsonian site number, which is a kind of a kind of social security number that has a very particular alphanumeric sequence that you wouldn't see anywhere anywhere else in JSTOR. And if we narrow it into JSTOR's archaeology and anthropology fields, we'll be able to pull we'll be able to pull those out. At the moment, we have about uh, ten years of the journal American Antiquity, which is the, the the American's flagship journal uh, archeolo uh, of archaeological history. We have about 10 years worth of, uh, worth of American antiquity text mines uh, showing where uh, Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian site numbers show up. And we can link that back to Dina. Uh, we also link to places like the Paleo Indian Database of the Americas, which is a, uh, a big crowdsourcing. Scientific database related to the earliest inhabitants of the Americas back during the Pleistocene, known as the Paleo Indian period. Uh, we also link to the Digital Archaeological Record, uh, a, major a major repository for governmental publications uh, that I'll talk more about in a bit. We link to the Canadian Radiocarbon Database, which, uh, which provides uh, both anthropogenic and naturally occurring radio, uh, radiocarbon dated materials. Um, and and uh, it's actually, although it's the Canadian radiocarbon database, they actually cover the span the entire globe. Um, we link to the Eastern Woodlands Household Archaeology Database, which is, uh, which is an attempt to mine the archaeological literature for architectural literature. And the, and the the people involved with uh, with EWAP at uh, the university at uh, the University of South Carolina uh, are, com are coming through old archaeological reports to get dimensions of houses to get uh, tables of data related to, related to household economics uh, throughout the North American North American timeline or at, uh, in the Eastern Woodlands and they, and. Are putting the are like Dina making those data available online. We provided uh, those researchers a way to organize and spatialize their data, <coughs> and uh, and they provide. You know, uh, and so we link back and forth to one another. If you're in Dina and you say, "Hey, now that I found all these neat archaeological sites, uh, which ones have architectural data?" Get it filtered. There you go. Um, and and uh, also with the. Uh, uh, digital archaeological uh, archaeological archive of comparative slavery, uh, the Chaco Research Car Archive, Archaeology Southwest, which is uh, dealing with a variety of, uh, of uh, southwestern uh, archaeological cultures and regional and regional activities. So, uh, of course, the, the big reason we're here today is because uh, about a year ago. Uh, my colleagues and I published uh, an article called Sea Level Rise and Archaeological Site Destruction, which recognized that about 20,000 20, archaeological sites spread across the, uh, spread across the Gulf Coast and, uh, and uh, mid-Atlantic and, and did the South Atlantic coast of the United States are in immediate danger of, uh, of destruction. <coughs> The nature of, ar of archaeological information practices, um, and this is a global, this is a global issue, not particularly necessarily particular to the United States, is such that no one had ever seen this kind of presentation before. Uh, and in fact, uh, there have been 
three, uh, you know, uh, our, 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 uh, our, our creation of this map uh, and associated data sets uh, uh, has inspired uh, three separate uh, research projects in different places around the world uh, so far in just the last year. Um, but no one, had, no one had ever seen a massive presentation of what is going to happen to archaeological resources related to various scenarios of sea level rise before. And that's because uh, in our, in our federal system of archaeological data management uh, in the United States, every, every single state and sometimes uh, different uh, management areas within states, uh, although actually not in these, uh, not in, these uh, in particular, uh, will have different data, will have different uh, data archival and data management regimes. Uh, the, the scientific uh, infrastructure and governmental infrastructure surrounding archaeological inquiry is such that everything is separated into little silos based on where researchers are, based on where heritage managers are. And none of these things, none of these sites were ever capable of being interoperated before because they're in incompatible file formats, although they're talking about similar scientific and cultural concepts, they're using different keyword structures, the, uh, interop the potentially interoperable measurements they're using may be presented in a variety of different, uh, different numerical formats. <coughs> there was no way to move things one to one with, you know, with one another um, at all. And in fact, uh, when we, fir when we uh, first put in our, uh, our first NSF grant, um, the, the nature of, archeolo uh, of archaeological uh, site information management in this country uh, is so diverse that one, of, that one of our reviewers actually wrote, if they make this work, if they make it work, <laughs> being a, the important predicate there, it'll be the best money NSF ever spent in archaeology. Um, fortunately, we made it work. <laughs> um, but it, it's not easy, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit, because although we, although we with Dina have interoperated these things, the success of uh, the success of what we've done, uh, what we've done, can only be, can only be acted upon with uh, co with commensurate changes in the various state regimes and uh, potentially federal regimes that are overarching all these, not just these areas, but all our other coastlines, and of course in our interiors, because those are, uh, those of course are going to be affected by uh, sea level rise as well. So what you see here is, uh, you know, in a nice red to green uh, color, uh, color ramping, uh, the, area, the areas in red and the areas in orange are Really, by the end of this century, they're going to be gone. Uh, if, if one takes you know, the most modest uh, models of sea level of sea level rise, uh, with, a one, with a zero to one meter rise, and you look at what's going on in Miami, you look at what's going on in New Orleans, uh, what's going on in Virginia Beach, uh, you know, obviously sea level rise, you know, sea level rise is occurring. These things are going to disappear. We're going to, or we're going to lose. Uh, approximately, uh, you know, uh, about uh, a little over 20,000 known, uh, known sites, and that's an important point to mention. These are known sites, literally. But, um, to, uh, within that, we're going to lose uh, about 5% uh, about of these sites represent some of the earliest uh, peoples in the America, another 10% represent uh, early uh, represent uh, early transitions to the Holocene period. Uh, Terrific uh, examples of humans dealing with climate change. Uh, about another 25% deal with the earliest instances of agriculture. Uh, people dealing with agricultural change, uh, agricultural uh, growth, trying uh, trying to account for larger populations, <coughs> dynamic population sizes, um, and. and uh, you know, another 50% relate uh, relate to the historic period, uh, colonial period, all of the all of our uh, historic uh, ethnic, diver ethnic diversity.
University, um, but also really, uh, you know, really national, you know, uh, national identity sites like uh, Fort Jefferson and the Florida Keys, like Cape, Can uh, like Cape Kennedy slash Canaveral, like the White House. Uh, these are all important things. Yes? I have a really basic question. Yeah, yeah sorry. Is there, what's the definition for archaeologists of the site? That is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. be, you, Excuse me. I have not been. No, no, I have, no, no. I have not been her in the slightest. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what is the definition yeah. and who, who published which institution or the country has a consistent definition and published this information. That's excellent. Can you give me about three minutes? Okay. And I'll be right there. Okay. Okay. Because, that, because that is, you know, your, your question, the question of what constitutes a site. How is it defined culturally and scientifically, and then how is it and then how is it recorded? Is vital for understanding uh, the various conceptual uh, conceptual differences and linkages that can bring all these data together. The the reason we can make this map, and the reason I can tell you the percentages of different sites that we're going to lose within the uh, within the over twenty thousand sites that are definitely going to disappear, is because we put that hard work in the library. Uh, trying to figure out where are those bridging concepts um, and how are those represented in the databases that we're using. Um, and, so, uh, and that's really the vital point in terms of figuring out what we're going to do here. Um, as we've been talking with, uh, fo uh, with uh, folks from the National Park Services um, working, working group on heritage and climate change, as we've been working with uh, the Society for American Archaeology's uh, working group on climate change. The, the unfortunately re uh, vital fact here is that uh, you know, the sites in orange and red, uh, they, they, are, uh, they are marked. They, they will be gone uh, by the end of the century at, uh, uh, at, even at uh, the most, uh, uh, even, even at the uh, the most promising uh, sea level scenarios. So we have to know <coughs> what we're going to do. Archaeology is, uh, as I'll talk more about in a minute, uh, has, does not have deep pockets. Uh, in fact, the entire, ar uh, the entire archaeological uh, and, and, and anthropological uh, directorates within the National Science Foundation don't even add up to one major, one major medical project at NIH. Um, the, it's going to be impossible to actually take care of all of, of all those <coughs> of all those sites that are that are going to go under the water. Uh, so we have to. Uh, so the next question is, what do we triage? And that's where we're, that's where we're at at the moment. These are the really uh, very current questions. So being able to assess what time periods, what cultures are are being threatened in, the, in these areas, we can then try to think about what don't we know. What will we be really sad we don't know in 100 years when these are all gone and start to allocate our efforts accordingly? Uh, because uh, although uh, there is often uh, there is often the uh, there's often the common misconception that oh won't these sites be well protected if they go underwater? And the answer is no. Uh, the ocean is a very damaged is a very damaging environment. Uh, thing, uh, things like shipwrecks may preserve well because those are uh, those are native seasoned wood and materials that were uh, originally meant to withstand uh, uh, the elements in the ocean, but also, uh, you know, art, uh, shallowly buried archaeological sites along a dynamically changing coast are going to erode, are going to be part of a massive erosional process um, as riptides and storm surges move back, move back and forth, uh, and plus the water logging of uh, sensitive and, and uh, fragile um, so, the, uh, so this made a lot of press. Um, uh, we, the uh, International Council on Museums, UNESCO, all of these, uh, all, all of these uh, folks had various stories on, on it. I was late to a, I was late to a, a departmental <laughs> meeting because I, I saw myself in USA Today while eating breakfast and had to put it on Facebook. <laughs> and I wrote, oh, I'm late for a meeting. Anyway, um, also, Fox News, uh, you know, just to show that. It really is broad. It really is broad. Interesting. I forget why we end up the box a little bit. Um, so, getting to your question, 
how is Dina coming up with you know, how is Dina coming up with uh, these definitions of archaeological sites? How do uh, and how can we transform archaeolo archaeological heritage management and information management in order to make our make the work of all archaeologists in the Americas interoperable and use them to study these and use them to understand. Uh, these big changes across a landscape, in various eco zones, across uh, ver across various uh, political regimes. So it, it's important to point out that what we're doing uh, is, in some ways, kind of uh, kind of a it's the current I won't say culmination. It's the current moment in a very old dream in archaeology. This is a uh, this is a, a hand drawn diagram from 1937. Uh, that uh, that shows what was then uh, the uh, the density of uh, what was what was at the time considered to be one of the earliest peoples to inhabit the Americas, but it's now known to be uh, a kind of middle range middle range to late uh, Paleo Indian Paleo Indian phenomenon, uh, kind of late in the Pleistocene. Um, but they were attempting, they were prior to radiocarbon dating, prior to any other radiometric dating, um, with, om uh, with only uh, rudimentary understanding of all of the geological processes that are covering archaeological sites across the continent. Uh, folks were trying, uh, researchers were trying to create density maps to understand population dynamics uh, even across the continent. So this uh, leads to a question is, of uh, you know, how, what sorts of data are the archaeologists using to create archaeological big data? Uh, archaeological big data is, com is completely different than what most people think of when you see big data in the news. You know, when you think about tracking, uh, you know, uh, tracking the output of uh, the radio output of stars, or tracking uh, all cell phone users. Uh, in the state of California, or looking at, uh, or looking at uh, massive amounts of uh, you know, electric, uh, electrical power usage across the grid, um, those are a, uh, those are tend to be a single vector of data or a couple of vectors of data that are amassing from uh, millions or billions of points. But what archaeologists are doing uh, instead are dealing with uh, Pretty small amounts uh, of really complex things. An uh, you know, an uh, as you saw, in, as I noted in the earlier slide, Dina has about half a million archaeological sites within it, and the and really the entirety of the digital index in North, in North American archaeology is put on a thumb drive, but with, uh, because it's mo it's mostly text. And all, but all of those tech, you know, all of those text uh, elements, uh, and all of those hyperlinks relate to a complex web of, vari <coughs> of varieties of, cult uh, of cultures, of locations where those cultures are, of variability within our definitions of how those people are existing in particular places and points in time. Uh, and and uh, you know, all of the caveats and all of the uh, additional vectors of data that are coming in that are coming in to make definitions of where people are. An, ar uh, an archaeological site is, at, at its simplest, a place where somebody was in the past and left something behind. How that is defined. Is up to is always is through the lens of the investigator. In the state of Indiana, for instance, if you want to take a governmental position on it, uh, if there is a if there is some piece of trash in the ground that or on top of the ground uh, that is older the, that can be dated to uh, 1870 or earlier, it's an archaeological site. So you get one. Uh, you know, small pottery shirt or a piece of broken glass that can be definitively understood to come from uh, that period. It gets it, it gets a definition in the state database. That's not always the case everywhere else. Indiana takes a maximal approach. It's not to say that uh, that, that that small piece of pottery or glass is in itself particularly meaningful uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a kind 
kind of uh, in a kind of evidentiary chain, but it lets you know where something might be. And from a management perspective, that's vital to these folks because there are all sorts of government uh, regulations that require them to know where things are. Uh, and it might be important scientifically in the future, but it doesn't mean that little piece is scientifically valid at the moment. Uh, you can expand that to larger, to larger towns uh, of people, both in the <coughs> history and in, and in the historic period. Uh, and then you get into the question of where you make uh, cut marks between political areas or between ethnic uh, sectors of multicultural towns that may, that may have distinct neighborhoods of people. Uh, you know, do, you call, uh, do you call them one large archaeological site? Do you call them several archaeological sites? In the state of Illinois, for instance, uh, there are, uh, there, are uh, large, uh, there are large prehistoric towns uh, dated to about 12, uh, 1200 CE that have uh, uh, that are big walled compounds, uh, you know, hundreds of acres in, di in, in diameter. But uh, and within them, they have large earth, uh, large earthworks, uh, earth <coughs> pyramids. Uh, on top of which there were temples or houses, houses of leaders, or, uh, or graves for the honored dead, uh, or combinations of all of the above. In Illinois, uh, in terms of management strategies, each one of those things, uh, it, each mound within the larger town uh, gets its own site number, uh, and potentially areas uh, uh, within that town get different site numbers. Uh, it's a management strategy not a scientific one. And so there's this tremendous interplay in how archaeology does things. So when we think about how archaeological data are coming, are coming into DINA, we have to think about all of the translational processes, which directly relate to scientific practices uh, as, things are, as objects are being excavated, as boundaries are being determined. And although these are, you know, are various, they do fall into distinct categories and boundaries that can be understood and, and communicated in DINA. Um, we have to think about when data are <coughs> from, uh, because we're dealing archaeologically with, lo with longitudinal data of, that, were, that have been produced over a century now, really, uh, or more in terms of scientific excavation. We have to think about how transitions to different technologies and different management and different uh, investigative techniques relate to changes in uh, interpreter strategies. We have to think uh, we have to think about how once those data come out of the ground and are brought back to a laboratory, <coughs> the laboratory is where three quarters of archaeological work actually happens. So then we have to think about that all those same practices changes in, changes in. Uh, to, uh, changes in investigator strategies, changes in technologies, precision and record keeping play into moving data back and forth from the past to the present. We have to think about, uh, the, about the, the growth of things like remote sensing, uh, uses of uh, magnetometers, ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity. All of these things change the interpretive qualities of how sites are defined that archaeologists use, uh, you know, because now they're able to see more than just plumes of material. They're able to see uh, changes in uh, subsurface chem uh, chemistry and physics uh, to be able to see where people have compacted Earth, where people have actually created anthropogenic changes uh, in the subsurface that are completely invisible uh, to, the, to the naked eye or any, any visible uh, structure. Uh, and of course, we also have uh, we're constantly getting new uh, new kinds of materials. Drones being uh, drones, uh, which are doing uh, all the survey elements I showed uh, I showed before. Um, we can now automate that, and so archaeology is in fact starting to deal with an issue that the Defense Department uh, real realized uh, over a decade ago that we almost have too much data uh, in some ways to conveniently store. And, and keep interpreting in individual labs. So this, so the question of interoperability, as people are doing all these unique uh, investigations, becomes even more becomes even more imperative. Uh, 
And in the United States, this is especially important because archaeology is both is both is heritage science and law. Uh, you know, all of the <coughs> Talk, uh, I'm talking a lot about the, uh, the cultural concepts that archaeologists use to make, uh, make definitions of what people were doing. I talk a lot about, uh, uh, and, and we're talking about the scientific ways that we're using me measurement and assessment and data points to create the data behind those interpretations. But in the United States, a lot of, uh, most of that science and interpretation is actually done not by folks like Jay and me, uh, but, by, uh, but under, by people working in regulatory governmental regimes uh, known as cultural resource management or heritage management. Uh, 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 here, uh, what's known as compliance archaeology or cultural resource management accounts for probably 90% of the archaeological work done in this country. It is mandated science, uh, which uh, dates back in some ways to 1900, but the, uh, the, really big, uh, the really big legislation involved here is the National Historic Preservation Act. Uh, with, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, laid, the fa laid the foundation for the federal government requiring all states and territories within the United States to keep, volumin uh, to keep voluminous records about heritage places. Uh, and this, uh, this created a legislative demand, a statutory demand, that archaeological sites be defined, be given, a, uh, be given definitions and protections of legal codes. But those definitions and protections are going back to uh, some uh, to some varieties of scientific practices now defined uh, some uh, sometimes the same between states, but oftentimes as we talked about between just Indiana and Illinois, with a variety of different schemes. So although we know uh, at the moment it's estimated there are probably about three million archaeological sites <laughs> in, in the United States at the moment. We, uh, we just don't know actually. There's, although the, gov the federal government demands that all these records be kept, it is a constantly changing number as states add new, uh, add new sites into the mix. And nobody's asked how many there are for about 20 years, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, so the National Historic Preservation Act it creates a, a demand for constant scientific uh, assessment of archaeological sites for the express purpose that a state will let the federal government know uh, when the federal government is impacting heritage resources with uh, disbursement of money or actually breaking of ground on a federal project. So <coughs> if, uh, for instance, uh, Camp Atterbury uh, here, uh, here in Indiana, uh, 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 the, Na the Naval Surf uh, Surf Surface Warfare Center down in southern Indiana, uh, if they decide to open up a new testing range to bomb various areas within their, within their uh, base, they need to make sure that there aren't any archaeological sites. Or if there are, they need to make sure that relevant information is removed and then they bomb away. Um, the, or if uh, a highway is being built with federal money. The state can build that highway, but they have to assure the federal government that they're taking care of heritage resources. So uh, back in the 90s, uh, there was an attempt to try and stitch all these things together, kind of an early, uh, early attempt at what Dina is doing again now. It was called the National Archaeological Database Project. Um, and it really didn't work. Um, unfortunately, it, it was an idea that, as Bob Dylan said, would say, is far behind its rightful time. Um, it, the, the archaeologists behind it had a tremendous idea, but unfortunately all of the states simply didn't have data structures available to actually create that database. In fact, when we started building DINA, there was, uh, the state of Mississippi was, uh, and still is, in a transition from paper records to an actual, to an actual electronic database. Because their work, as de demanded under the 
uh, under the National Historic Preservation Act doesn't necessarily mean it has to be kept in any particular database format. You just need to have a way of, a way of looking at a map, like say a paper map. The government tells you what it's going to bomb or where it's going to build a road. You look at that place on the map and you say, yeah, there are these archaeological sites there. And then you hand the file folder off to the relevant people and they can turn it into whatever data they need. Um, it still has the same scientific information in it, but um, different format. So, uh, DINA, because we're bringing all this together, has been endorsed by the Society for American Archaeology, the Society for Historical Archaeology, and the American Anthropological Association. Uh, we're also supported by the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, because tribes uh, in, in, a, in the federal system are considered uh, more, more or less uh, akin to uh, state level entities. They have their own art uh, state historic preservation offices. They have their own databases. Um, and so, and we're currently working with the Eastern Band of Cherokee and the Seminole in helping them create uh, new data management uh, schema for relating to their own particular heritage. And the processes that Dean is using to transform American digital archaeology are, are very much like those being used to transform a lot of the federal government at the moment over the last several years. It's, it, it's very serendipitous that right about the same time that we started working on the digital index was at the same moment that the Obama administration in 2013 put out an executive order mandating that uh, st uh, mandating that federal offices start making open and machine readable data the standard for federal government practice in the United States. Uh, this is going to ultimately uh, create unfunded mandates uh, down to all of, the relate, uh, all of those inter-office uh, inter relationships with state governments as well. <coughs> so Dean is providing a way for uh, all of these state offices, tribal offices, regional, uh, uh, regional and local offices, to help translate their information uh, up to the uh, up to the federal level, or with each other uh, on peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Uh, and it's important to point out that that you know, as fraught as politics are in the United States at the moment, interoperable government data, open government data, remains. Uh, a real bipartisan strength. The, um, the, the, uh, the House and Senate, uh, both in, in, uh, the last, <coughs> in the last Congress, have, actually the last two Congresses, have repeatedly uh, passed separate uh, open, government, uh, open government data legislations to turn, those exact, turn that Obama era executive order in 2013, to turn that into federal law. Um, but they keep failing to reconcile them. They pass, They both pass with, I think it was 99 to 0 in the Senate, and like 400 to, uh, 400 to nothing, just people didn't show up to vote. Uh, I don't think anyone actually voted against them. Uh, but they keep failing to reconcile them. But it does have tremendous bipartisan, uh, bipartisan support. And the, the principles of open government data uh, are that the data should be complete, you should get primary data in a timely fashion, it should be publicly accessible, machine readable, um, and it should be, uh, you know, people should be generally free to reuse it um, in whatever way they see fit. Uh, and DINA takes uh, the National Heritage Pre Preservation Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, as a kind of original open government mandate from the 60s that, you know, when the Historic Preservation Act says that archaeological data are part of our living community life, it is irreplaceable and its protection is in the public interest. Uh, it should be around to ensure future generations have the opportunity to use it. We have to increase knowledge of them and uh, most importantly for DINA, uh, as we keep telling uh, folks in the federal government, <laughs> please work with us, um, it, it's necessary and appropriate for the Fed to accelerate preservation programs and give maximum encouragement uh, to groups that are undertaking, pres that are undertaking preservation 
um, by uh, private means as well as governmental means, and that we should be working together as professionals to help, uh, maintain, the, uh, to help maintain these data. Um, and of course, that leads that then dovetails well with the government data, and they can work together. Um, in a nutshell, it's all working pretty well. I'll just skip over that. <laughs> Um, Dean is doing all those things, making it timely, making it accessible. Um, how are we doing this? Well, we're, make, we're having lots and lots of workshops for uh, government professionals, for, uh, for museum professionals, uh, both at state, tribal, local levels. Uh, we're constantly sending uh, teams to the annual meeting of the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers to help build capacities within tribal governments. Uh, most recently this summer, uh, I went out to Billings, Montana for a week to talk to the Bureau of Land Management. As a, as a good example, the BLM uh, has to work across uh, a huge number of western states where they're getting these data from, uh, from state databases, uh, but all of these data are not interoperable and very, in a very timely way. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of these sites are threatened by fire. The, uh, the BLM, in, during fire season, can tell emergency fire crews where sites are and potentially how big they are, but they have no way of knowing what those sites are, what is being threatened, what is going to be damaged, because, uh, you know, because between uh, Colorado, Montana, Montana, Utah, Arizona, they're all, uh, et cetera, they're all these uh, incompatible uh, definitions that can't be, that, that can't be drawn one-to-one -one through a database of this name goes with that name, goes with this name, goes with that name. Um, you know, they, they, they haven't had the capacity to translate them, they can't tell the firefighters what they might, need, how they might need to change their behaviors to protect those site boundaries in a more efficient way. Because uh, sites that are made up of, re uh, of say, uh, a, lot of, a lot of easily damaged material, like a bison kill site, which has a lot of, maybe a lot of surface bone, which could uh, be burned up or explode under high heat, will be affected very differently from, uh, a, from a stone tool procurement and manufacturing site uh, where the rocks may fall somewhat in high heat, but mainly they'll get burned over and the rocks will remain safe because they're rocks. Uh, it, uh, these, are, uh, these are behaviors also you know, in the interior, that in the interior of the United States, the climate change is going to drive uh, just as much. We're going to have to understand how climate change is affecting things in the interior as well as in our coast. Um, so we're giving back to our government partners by doing uh, doing video uh, doing uh, video talks uh, to, on, uh, at the behest of the National Park Service, um, archived on YouTube. We're also work, we're currently <coughs> at, uh, getting back to the coasts. We're working with the state of Virginia at creating their own crowdsourcing uh, archaeological site uh, archaeological site reporting uh, portal where in the event of a storm uh, with, uh, with, uh, with storm surges or flooding, uh, this, is a, this is a public portal that the state of Virginia is going to put out where, uh, where uh, members of the public can say, hey, I've seen an archeological site in this area or this area that's, that is washing out or being, da or being damaged in some way and this will immediately come back to, to the uh, state archaeologist's office so they can, uh, so they can uh, respond to the potential damage. And of course, all of, you know, this is possible through DINA's uh, linked open data strategies. It allows us to, it allows us to uh, you know, take the archaeological site data that's coming from the Virginia database, um, Put it with these other, you know, these other things to help uh, enhance uh, enhance the, the structure. So, what are some other things we can do with DNA as well? Uh, other ways we're doing that. Uh, you, know, you can see, for instance, uh, a variety of sites from the uh, from the early Archaic period, uh, and with those, you could uh, you could uh, look you know, look at uh, 
various things going along with them. We're using uh, part, of my, uh, part of my efforts with the project uh, here, at, here at IUSB are to use Canvas as a, mo as a module for teaching, uh, you know, for teaching uh, college students in, uh, um, in other locations that's been used. Well, I don't do it myself, but we make public modules with IMLS money. Uh, these have been used at, nor uh, at uh, uh, Northwestern University. They've been used at uh, Adams State in Colorado, and they're about to be used at Texas Tech University uh, to teach people how different database strategies are affecting our understanding of the archaeological record. I'll show you uh, a live bit right now. Just, so for instance, here is, uh, here's that early archaic uh, data set I showed you a second ago. Uh, this is now live. I just I, I went ahead and preloaded this into, into Chrome, but uh, you can bring this up too if you just went into the if you went into the Dina website and you filter it. Uh, it's filtered by uh, nine uh, by uh, nine uh, nine thousand BCE to six thousand BCE. This is three thousand years into the Holocene. Uh, about 9,000 from BCE is the Pleistocene Holocene transition. So this is 3,000 years into our current environmental epoch after the last ice age. We can look back in time immediately and think about uh, the previous 3,000 the 3, years uh, prior to that, from, uh, from uh, uh, 12,000 BCE to 15,000 BCE. Uh, I'm sorry, 11,000. Uh, you can see 4,000 uh, 4, archaeological sites, suddenly 13,500 uh, archaeological sites. We can look, and a tremendous density in river valleys and, uh, and, uh, up, and uplands, which, uh, gives, which makes sense if you think about uh, the end of the last ice age. And if one goes through, goes down to um, if you can filter it by state if you're interested in it, uh, or you can start to filter it by this reference bias. You can find 141 archaeological sites in this group, which have uh, there are 24 journals in American antiquity. There are 14 that are described in the Federal Register. Uh, we have uh, these other databases as well. So it all, it's also helping us think about the limitations of not, uh, of not just governmental strategies, but of the actual um, scientific and cultural work archaeologists do. Um, you know, we can, uh, if we want to think about how we're protecting things from climate change, we also have to think about how we're interpreting the past as professionals, which isn't which. In 2018, we're trying to be much more ethical and representative uh, than we used to be, but recognize that we're dealing with a century of maybe not so great work. So for instance, here's the historic period uh, writ large in, in the current database. But if we tailor that by thinking about historic Native American, uh, less representative. We tailor it by historic African American, less representative. We're even less interested in thinking about oppression of African Americans. Um, certainly slavery uh, would be much more prevalent across the uh, southern United States than is represented in archaeological databases. We can think about uh, different kinds of oppression beyond slavery into, uh, that go into the present period you know, with prisons. Or we can think about just representation of 52% of the human population. Um, this was uh, one of the most uh, unfortunately surprising uh, things we found. Uh, this is actually two, uh, uh, two antebellum women's colleges. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, uh, no, no uh, no government uh, defines its, its sites as being important to women, except for those. 
Um, but on a, uh, in a you know, we do, uh, we, uh, that's no surprise. Maybe Americans aren't really interested in material and in, in infrastructure and materials. Factories tend to be uh, a very common thing. Uh, turpentine has, a, has an extreme, a, a pretty diverse, uh, a, a pretty broad representation. This is, I, uh, I use this because it's, a, you know, the, the, the turpentine industry in the South. Uh, is a real is a, a really vital and regionally specific occupation. I actually showed this at a meeting uh, some uh, uh, a year ago, and someone in the audience said, "Oh man, I just finished I just finished my master's thesis on turpentine <laughs> on turpentine factories, and I did all that work for nothing." <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, or we could think about uh, I felt bad. Uh, um, uh, or we can think about you know, big population changes um, you know, in the period uh, 900 to 1500, which in the Midwest uh, what, uh, had the growth of those uh, walled cities with pyramidal mounds within them, uh, the largest being Cahokia near East St. Louis, um, places that uh, you know, they had, bastion, they had uh, palisades with defensive bastions, uh, not unlike medieval walled towns in Europe, but uh, medieval walled towns in the United States. Uh, and around those larger towns, there were lots of there were lots of satellite communities, farming communities, where people uh, where, where people held allegiance to the leaders in the larger towns would send food, would send food, uh, would retreat to those larger defensive centers in times of war uh, or famine. And we can look writ large at the growth of these uh, at the growth of these sites. Uh, you know, starting at about 900, uh, you can then, so there, at, nine, at 900 CE, you've got about 29,000 sites, uh, real sites, that represent these, you know, that represent these cultures. Uh, 200 years later, you have only 18,000. This is a massive representation of what archaeologists have been claiming in a variety of regions uh, for decades, that after about 200 years, you have a tremendous political consolidation going on. Are moving. Uh, people are moving into larger communities. People are building uh, large, People are building more dense cities, uh, and we can, and we can uh, represent this in data. Uh, but then, interestingly, uh, after about 1300 CE, you also have a political cycling going on, where a lot of those dense political uh, political towns and cities uh, fall apart. They become, they become fractious, and people disperse again. So we're up to uh, 23,000 uh, 23, sites as things disperse a little bit and uh, the local landscape reshapes. So th this is the end. Uh, Dina has the, the ability to represent a lot, of, uh, a lot of the American archaeological landscape and to help us solve a, uh, a great many management issues as well as scientific issues. But it, it has a long way to go in terms of Deepening, uh, uh, deepening our uh, our reach into actual scientific and management practice. Um, DINA exists through IU South Bend, through the University of Tennessee, uh, and our partners out in Berkeley. And a lot of people are working with our with our uh, with our efforts, but we have yet to hold uh, to really affect anybody's workflow. Uh, we have yet to affect large-scale management strategies, except you know, for, the, for the, the small instances in Virginia and otherwise that I should. And if we want to think about the protecting heritage, or even just understanding heritage better in the long run, it doesn't have to be DINA that's being used, so it's got to be something DINA-like. Uh, that, and that's something we, we keep hitting home at with our project, is that you know, this, is, this is going to be the, the work of another generation of archaeologists. But it's not unlike uh, epidemiologists uh, learning about big data. It's not unlike uh, astrophysicists learning about big data. Uh, you know, archaeologists are now on that learning curve, and we're, we're bringing it together. So, uh, thanks. I used up my hour. <laughs>
using that uh, map of threatened sites um, mm -hmm. to you know, institute a different mode of operating for archaeologists and those sites that are definitely going to be lost. And one of the reasons it takes a long time to do this work is you have to be careful to preserve the site. Well, mm -hmm. they're not going to be around. So yeah. maybe there can be a different technique for studying those yeah. sites so yeah. that's destructive, but you learn from them before they go underwater. So there is, so the Society for American Archaeology has a, a task force at the moment which is trying to, which is trying to create disciplinary priorities for these things with the recognition that you know, we've got 15 years before, uh, before things start getting really bad in the first sites. Um, but, uh, you know, how that, uh, how that's going to play out, uh, frankly, I, I don't know. I hope, uh, my hope is that there, uh, uh, you know, that the, so the answer to your question is we're working on it. Um, you know, there, there is, you know, the, the, the recognition of these issues is really about three years old um, in our American archaeology, global archaeology. Um, that, uh, you know, we've talked about, we, we've certainly talked about, hey, you know, the sea level is rising, but they've also talked about it in uh, Miami, right? And like, hey, wait a minute, now that, now that things are actually underwater, people's uh, feet are being put to the water, as it were. Um, and, and we're suddenly realizing we have to do something. So my my guess is in the next 24 months, uh, the large the large scientific societies uh, and the National Park Service are going to come to uh, some conclusions about what are the most uh, the, the most unknown and threatened things that we need to study. And my guess is a lot of those are going to be at that Pleistocene Holocene transition uh, because those are the uh, most, uh, those are both the most rare, but they're also uh, potentially, in terms of actionable scientific value, uh, they may be the most important for preserving our, ourselves in the moment because they tell us what human beings were doing during the last big environmental change moment that we, that we dealt with. Yeah. Of course, after disasters is what interests me. Um, after a big one happens, a joint field office opens, and there's mm -hmm. always a GIS unit inside there that does mapping for a variety of purposes, including historic preservation. Have you had any connections to try to integrate DINA with those kinds of units? Um, yeah, so that was, well, so there was, that's what was going on with Virginia, mm -hmm. um, what, they're, uh, what they're dealing with at the moment. I'm talking like at a national level. No. As part of the national recovery no, framework. No, it's, it's just simply not happening yet. Um, uh, well, yes. Contact we, me. You've so that was a big part of our... <laughs> Uh, a big part of our meeting with the National Park Service uh, a couple of years ago in our workshop with them what was to uh, try to uh, was to try to get them to do some of these things. Unfortunately, even you know, even within the National Park Service, uh, there is not uh, necessarily a cohesive uh, interoperable data management strategy between parks. Parks have uh, parks have. Uh, unique databases that sometimes relate to those around them, sometimes don't. Um, and they have to do with the peculiar uh, you know, invest investigative history of that area. Um, that is the defining criteria, not any other larger uh, larger scheme. So at the moment, uh, the, the, the NPS is considering how they can use our work, as, as the BLM, are all considering how they can use our work to inform themselves bringing those things together, but uh, to, have a, uh, to have a, you know, and then, and then actually NPS and BLM themselves are having very large political debates as to if there were a bigger national structure, uh, whose would it be, um, and which one, uh, and uh, you know, that becomes politics as much as science. Good questions. Yeah. I noticed that in the middle of the map around the mountain area, there's a really, really few sites there. And right. It, so, is it, is it, is so, it oh, yes, yes, I should have. So, so this is yeah, so this is where uh, so these are uh, these are areas we're still working to fill in with National Science Foundation money. Um, all, all of these little isolated sites uh, are uh, items that have been populated with uh, IMLS money. Uh, these are museum. These are. Um, sites that have been published in 
uh, scientific journals or represented in museum collections. Uh, but the larger, uh, but the uh, the larger creation of uh, dense site uh, dense site coverage like we have here hasn't been done yet on, uh, on the through the NSF side um, because we're, we're simply working our yeah. I think it might be a related question. It's a, so, in a sense, we're always creating archaeological sites, right? Yes. Yeah, it's totally it's totally a food member. Mm -hmm. and some of the yep. Is there a, a sort of a mechanism for uh, measuring how many were, were sort of either missing or ruining or destroying uh, along the way? Mm -hmm. So, so that you're, you're, you show how many were the yep. if the, the sea level went up. But you know, forest fires and mm -hmm. all of that. So, is there a mechanism for that sort of? Yeah, there's a. Uh, there are lots of uh, very very particular regional uh, predictive models that can be uh, that can be used um, that are usually done on uh, either the level of a county or maybe the level of uh, somewhere between the level of a county and a state. They usually don't get much larger than that. Um, and, and based on the incidence of archaeological sites with particular landforms, particular uh, geological and environmental uh, attributes, you can, uh, you, can, you can create predictive models as to how many you might expect there to be in unsurveyed, unstudied areas of that type, um, assuming people in the past uh, liked that environmental area that's been unstudied uh, to the extent they liked others. Um, in terms of, you also had a question about uh, we're constantly creating archaeological sites. That's a trickier one. Um, in the, the, that early attempt to stitch together uh, all the archaeological databases in the country failed in the 90s. There hasn't been an assessment of the velocity at which we're defining new archaeological sites. That's uh, something we're really interested in uh, as we're moving DINA forward is to what extent is our knowledge of the past changing uh, in terms of quantity as well as quality. Uh, because big uh, big interpretive changes always make the news. Uh, you know, hey, there were, uh, instead of people being here 14,000 years ago, there were people here 16,000 years ago. But how many were there? And if it, if it doesn't, then it is less easy to tell. Uh, but as we put all these together, we are able to start tracking uh, the total number of Sites being produced in different in different categories, we'll be able to trace that velocity. Um, but it's not, it's on the it's a great question. Let's thank Josh for his time and you can say that's the